Good morning, church. Wonderful singing, isn't it? Amen, amen, amen. Well, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. God bless you, all our mothers and everybody. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, welcome back to the uh, to the Owens. Sir Carmel and Brother Al is right there. Amen. Good to be back. Happy Lord's Day, everybody. So this morning, um, we will be continuing our lesson on uh, the book of John with regards to the vine and uh, bearing much fruit. And the, uh, the title lesson for this morning will be The Fruit of Christian Character. Let's go ahead and uh, read our scripture reading a while ago. In uh, John chapter 15, verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, proving yourselves to be my disciples. We prove our servanthood to God by bearing fruits. And there is no other way that I can think of that we can be pleasing to God than to bear much fruit. And this can only be accomplished by abiding in Jesus Christ. And uh, as we abide in Christ, our Christianity becomes active. Okay? And uh, our Christianity becomes an active lifestyle to the very end. And uh, I guess you know that being a Christian, you know, it is not a call for just to do nothing. We are to do something. And the very concept of abiding in the vine, abiding in Jesus Christ, means that we are active and active from the word act. Okay? We are not frozen. We are not frozen, we are not a statue or not moving. We are not a, like a robot. No. That's why believing, or they say that faith only, or believe only, faith alone. So that is why believing only or faith alone won't work. It can't be. When the Bible tells us, that it is impossible to please God without faith in the book of Hebrews. It is an active kind of faith, one that is obedient to God. It is acting and moving. Now, I want you to remember this word act and um, the three letters of the word act, which we, the root word from the, the root word from the active word active. Okay. So first, we have the word active. Active, it means we are engaged. We are involved. It means we must be actively involved in the work of the Lord, in the work of the church. Engage in the propagation of the gospel. Okay. Now, second, letter C is conscious or consciousness it means awareness it means response so we must be aware and we must be mindful of what's going on in the body of christ we must be all mindful of what's going on inside the church inside the congregation we belong to it calls for an initiative on important matters and not waiting for someone to start. It is our response to challenges that are presented before us for the benefit of the kingdom. And the letter T stands for thrive. Thriving. It means developing. Developing. Developing in character. It means growing. Growing in maturity and growing 
growing in numbers. So as we can therefore see that being a Christian, there is something that we must do. And according to this word, we must be active, we must be conscious, and we must try. And then again, I, we go back to the question last week, what does the Lord require of his disciples? What does the Lord require from all of us? Well, again, we said to bear much fruit, according to John chapter 15, verse 8. Now, last week, in passing, I mentioned this fruit of discipleship, and this involves two things. The fruit of discipleship, fruit of Christian character, which is the fruit of our faith, obedience, and the fruit of the Spirit, which is our character. And the second one, the second fruit of discipleship is fruit of witnessing, soul winning. Now, we will talk about the fruit of discipleship, the fruit of Christian character. But first, we must define what is a Christian character. A Christian character, the integrity of a man based on God's teachings born out of love for God. Okay? The integrity of a man based on God's teachings born out of love for God. Now, as I often point out, integrity can be a person's, can be negative or positive. Okay? Integrity can either be negative or positive. Okay? And as we look at our definition, our definition of Christian character and the word integrity there is on the positive character of a person. So when we say integrity, it doesn't always mean on a positive character of a person. It might also mean the negative character of a person. But in our definition of a Christian character, we can see that the word integrity there is on the positive character of a person, a godly character for that matter. Now, we ask, what is the word integrity? The word integrity is the concept of consistency of actions, values, methods, measures, principles, expectations, and outcomes. And that is a wonderful definition of the word um, integrity. Now, in the word integrity, we must look at the word consistency. Because consistency is the key to understanding the word integrity. So consistency defines or is defined as being the same person regardless of when someone is looking or not. You are that person whether somebody's looking, somebody's with you, or somebody's without you, or not with you. So that is a person's integrity. That is a person's character. You never change. And as I often say, sometimes there is a, 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 a church character of a person. When a person is inside the church, when a person is with his fellow brothers and sisters, you can see his Christian character. But when that person is with his other friends, <laughs> you will see his other side of character. You see, But when we talk of integrity, that is consistency. Whether you are with your church family or with your other group of friends, group of family, you still have the same character. So consistency, being the same person regardless of when someone is looking or not. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that is what integrity is. Consistency. Paul said, even in my absence or even in my presence, continue. Continue what you've been doing. Continue to live a Christian character. But by, by general principle, 
going to the Christian character. By general principle, to have that Christian character in us, faith is a must. We must all have that faith in the Lord. Now again, remember the, in the book of Hebrews, reminds us that it is impossible to please God without faith. Now, only a, a real person having true faith in Jesus Christ will exhibit a Christian character. You will have that right integrity if you have that real faith in Jesus Christ. Again, only, only a, a real Christian having that real faith in Jesus Christ will exhibit a Christian character because faith in that person will give birth to obedience. And remember, obedience is the fruit of our faith. God said that we must bear much fruit. The first fruit is the fruit of our Christian character. And as we have said, the fruit of our faith is obedience. In John chapter 15, verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. <clears throat> In John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Now, analyzing carefully the words of Jesus himself, faith is not just something we say. Faith is not just something we think of, but it is about obedience to his commands. Now let's go first to John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep or obey my commands. Now I, I, I want you to look at your faith. I want you to look at your faith in the context of love and obedience. Love and obedience. Look at your faith. In that context, love and obedience. And let us harmonize everything. Okay. Now, the little conjunction, if, it plays an important role in that word or in that sentence. Okay. When we see the word if, we know that there is a condition that must be met, right? It is always, when there is a word, if, there is a condition that must be met. We obey. We follow Jesus because we love him. Right? We obey, we follow because we love Jesus Christ. Now, our obedience to Jesus Christ, our obedience is the byproduct of our love for Jesus Christ. Again, our obedience is the byproduct of our love for Jesus Christ. Now, our faith, our faith in Jesus is therefore our love for him that produces obedience to him. Are you following? Amen. Are you following? All right. Now, the conjunction if suggests that everybody, all of us, who love Jesus, who love Jesus must be subject or must subject himself in obedience to him. If you love me, keep, obey my commandments. If not, then you don't truly love Jesus because you are only fooling yourself. The condition is if you love Jesus, if you love him, you will obey his commands. And therefore, that is faith. Faith is obedience following Jesus Christ. As I have said a while ago, faith is not just something that we think of. Faith is not just something that is in our mind. Faith is something that we do. Faith is something that we obey. We obey because we love Jesus Christ. We love the Lord. Now, in John chapter 15, verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. Again, we see the word if. We see the word if suggesting a condition that must be met. The condition of being a friend of Jesus. You are my friends if. See, that's the condition. You are my friends if. 
and only if you will do what I command. Therefore, friendship and obedience, they are one, which means that we need to obey Jesus Christ to be his friend, right? Now, as set forth here in John chapter 15, verse 14, the only way to be his friend is through obedience, doing his will. Now, obedience to him causes friendship with him. So therefore, friendship with Jesus Christ is the byproduct of our obedience. You know, in the uh, social media, if you have your Facebook, you have to request, you know, friend request, right? And you will see somebody requesting you to accept his, uh, his request to be your friend. Now, same way, the same way. Jesus will only accept your friend request if and only if you obey his commands. If until now, you still, uh, you can see still in your friend request that Jesus Christ have not yet clicked the accept button, it means you are not obeying him. Again, the only way that we could be friends with Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 15, you are my friends if you do or what I command. Okay. So that's why we now understand, you know, with why James, in the book of James, told us that faith without work is dead. Faith without work is dead. The work of faith is about our obedience to God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Again, the work of our faith is about our obedience to God. As our faith produces obedience to God, the result will be the manifestation. We manifest the manifestation of how we live our lives, and this is the fruit of the spirit the second uh, fruit the fruit of the spirit which is our character so the fruit of our faith is our obedience and now we go to the fruit of our spirit because we have that faith in jesus christ we obey jesus christ and therefore we are living a godly way. Therefore, we are manifesting the principles in the Bible that we, everybody, so that we must, on how we must live. And as we live our obedience to God, and that is the fruit of the Spirit, which is our character. In Philippians chapter 4, 8 and 9, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Now before... <clears throat> Ending his letter to the Philippians, Apostle Paul encourages the, the brethren on the matters of utmost importance to every believer, and that is to focus their minds on the things that honor God. Now, Paul used the word finally. He used the word finally. He used that <clears throat> to make an important note and what he was about to say. So therefore, he used the word finally. And at the end of verse 8, Paul said, think about these things. 
Think about these things. Now, the Greek word for that phrase is logizomai. Logizomai. Now, which, uh, this is where our English word logic comes from. It means to reckon, take into account, and reason, and reason to a logical conclusion. Now, let me say that the, uh, the statement I said a while ago, okay, that our faith produces obedience to God. Now, it is therefore our actions uh, following what we believe. Okay? Our actions follows our belief. What is in our thoughts and what is in our minds. Okay? Mahatma Gandhi said, Your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habit becomes your values. Your values become your destiny. As they say, you are what you think. You are what you think. So again, our actions follows our beliefs, what we are thinking, what we have in mind. Now, Paul knew when he wrote to the brethren in Philippians, Paul knew the power of the mind. He knew the power of the mind. Our thoughts affect our actions. Our thoughts have a direct impact on our actions, on the way we live. Now, if you're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount in, in, in Matthew, the main theme there is the mind, the thoughts. The thoughts, the mind of a worldly man versus the minds or thoughts of a godly man. Now, let's read Mark, <clears throat> the book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 20. Mark, chapter 7, verse 20. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evil, evils come from inside and defile a person. Okay. The behavior of our mind, my dear brethren and friends, it must be geared towards two things. It must be geared towards two things. And according to Apostle Paul, he said, it must be of excellence and it must be of uh, praiseworthy. Excellence meaning morally good and praiseworthy meaning appropriate. Now, this excellence and praise worthy or worthy of praise must be which honor God. It must be which honor God because that's what God is all about. And therefore, we should also be that kind of a person. Okay. When you think of whatever is true, as Paul said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, when you think of those things, it must be that which is excellent or morally good and that which is worthy of praise, that which is appropriate because it relates to God's will and it honors God. So that's why when Apostle Paul said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, think all of these things, think about these things, because these things praises God. These things gives honor to God. Now, if we look at Mark chapter 7 again, let me go to Mark chapter 7. Right. Now, again, thinking about these things, see, all these evils come from inside and it defiles a person. So Apostle Paul 
wants us to think those good things, those good thoughts, because it honors God. And when we think of all these things, Mark said, all this evil comes from inside and defile a person. Not only it defiles you, but it affects our relationship with God. It hurts our relationship with God. Now, thinking about these things is what is contrary to what is excellence, contrary to what is praiseworthy. So there is nothing that will honor God if we keep on thinking, if we keep on doing about these things. These things will only defile a person and again will hurt your relationship with God. And it will ruin your life in the end. Now in Romans chapter 8, verse, verses 5 and 6, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Now, if we continue to live and to dwell our, and dwell our minds on what defiles a person, dwell our minds on what the flesh, what the flesh desires, Paul said, it will lead us to death. But if we will let the Spirit govern our minds, if we will think on those things that Paul mentioned in Philippians chapter 4, then it will lead us to life and peace. Now, as we can see, the total, the, the contrast between the Christian mind and the worldly mind. The Christian mind is set on what the spirit desires and the worldly mind is set on what the flesh desires. Again, the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. If you want to have life, abundant life, according to John chapter 10. And if you want to have peace of mind, let the Holy Spirit govern your thoughts. Let God govern our minds. And let us think about all those things with what Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. But if we want death, then dwell on what the flesh desires and you will have death. You see, the, the Holy Spirit desires us to live and to have peace. And in, in the process, in the process, it produces in us a Christian character. Now, a Christian character, it is just, it is far, far beyond just thinking about our material things, material needs and wants. It is far beyond that. Most people that I've talked with, their main concern is that when they give up their life for Jesus, again, I said this last week, they think of they're giving up their freedom to work. They're giving up their freedom to have material things you know but being a christian we we think far beyond that our mind is not set on what what are what are the material things but of course of course as we have uh learned a while ago with the with the class uh, led by uh, brother joe the rain, all the blessings, each and every one of us, okay, according to Matthew chapter 5, God sent the rain to all of us. Sunshine fell on every one of us, whether you be 
unbeliever or a believer. God bless each and every one of us. He blesses each and every one of us. See? But of course, somebody would ask, does this mean that I do not need to think about material things anymore? Of course not. Of course not. Being a Christian, we, 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 we also think, what are we going to eat? But that is not our priority. A Christian character prioritizes what pleases God. Christian character prioritizes what honors God. It only means that our priority is to live a godly life as we live our daily lives here on earth. Now, in verse 9 of Philippians chapter 4, okay, it says, What have you learned and received and heard and seen in me? Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Apostle Paul is telling us to practice these things as he did. Now, the word practice here is in the progressive tense. It, it is in the progressive tense. It means it is an ongoing process. Ongoing process. It doesn't stop. Okay? Now, it is a common conception that practice makes perfect. Right? That's the common conception. But I always say perfect practice makes perfect. Now, the reason for that, simple. Now, we all know Michael Jackson. They say that Michael Jackson, uh, in most of his dance rehearsals, um, is like he is already in the actual concert. Even, even if it is a, uh, a rehearsal, they say that he was like in the actual concert because he's a perfectionist. He's a perfectionist. Even though he is just practicing, he is like in front of millions of people. Now, if you are practicing your dance routine, just for example, in an ungraceful way, in an awkward way, you're dancing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Because you, you, you treat that as just a rehearsal. But soon, if you keep on practicing that in the actual, you will be doing like that. Because as I always say, perfect practice makes perfect. If we practice in an awkward way, in an ungraceful way, chances are that's what you will do. But if you practice perfectly, but if you practice in perfection, perfection you will get. See, Apostle Paul tells us, practice, practice, practice. Think about these things. Okay? Practice these things. Okay? That's why he said those things. He wants us to think about this, to think about all those things over and over and over again until they become you again we practice those things we think about those things until they become you now they say that it takes 60 plus days to make a habit okay. it's hard 60 days of doing it on a daily basis continuously for 60 days to make a habit. It's not easy, but it's doable. It is doable. Okay? If we just put our hearts and minds to it, then we will perfect, in perfection, those things that Apostle Paul mentioned a while ago. Now, Apostle Paul said, what you have heard and seen in me. Now, it means he was a living example. He was a living example. It also means that we are to live out. We are also to embody the true traits of a Christian character. 
Because for Apostle Paul, application matters. Again, as I have said, faith is not just something that you think of. Faith is something that you act upon. Faith is something that you, you, you put your life into it, that you live your life every day, in and out, every day. So Apostle Paul wants us to embody the Christian character that is uh, written in the great book. Now, some of the uh, Christian character, forgiveness. I have listed just two okay, of the Christian character. Number one is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a core Christian character. It's a core Christian character, part of our Christian faith. It's very much integral for a Christian, a Christian man to forgive. Now, people, they find it hard to forgive. It's, they, they find it hard to forgive. Why? Because they don't understand what goes into the word forgiveness. But if we understand what goes into the word forgiveness and the story that lies underneath or lies beneath the word forgiveness, hard becomes easy. It will be easy for us to forgive because we understand the meaning of the word or what goes into the word forgiveness. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32, be kind and tenderhearted to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Now this is the story. This is the story about forgiveness. This is the story that lies underneath the word forgiveness with so many things that we have done, with so many sins that we did against our God, God still forgives. That's why He sent His Son so that we could have that opportunity to come to Him and ask for forgiveness. And God is such a gracious God. If we come to Him in humility, and truly humble ourselves and ask for forgiveness, He will forgive you. He will forgive you. And He will wipe all those sins away as if nothing happens. You see, that is the story behind forgiveness. If we just understand the word forgiveness, what happened in that little word forgiveness, we can forgive also. And I'm telling you, there is no other way. If you were a Christian, a true servant of the Lord, there's no other way but to forgive. There's no other way but to forgive. Now, the other side of forgiveness, do we know what forgiveness can do? When a person practices forgiveness, it heals the heart. It heals the heart of a resentful man. It heals the heart of an angry man. Okay. Why? Because it frees himself from that hatred. When you try to forgive, and when you forgive, if you have that hatred, and when you forgive somebody, it frees you of that hatred. For so long that you have that hatred in you, and when you, when you forgive that person that sinned against you, you will have that freedom and you will be at peace. And it, call, and it can also change the person receiving the forgiveness. It can change that person. It also has the potential to transform relationships and to reconcile relationships. And forgiveness is part of the fruit that all of us must bear in, a, in our Christian character. Again, there's no other way around it. When somebody did us wrong, we just have to forgive. In Matthew 6, 14, 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, 
neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. The way of a Christian character is forgiveness. It is not vengeance. It is not revenge. God said, it is mine to avenge. As long as you have Christ in you, as long as you are a servant of the Lord, there's no other way but to forgive. Let us leave it to God. The word vengeance. And let us put in our hearts the word forgiveness. And finally, the word kindness. In Romans chapter 12, verse 20, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. On his head. The power of kindness. Christian character. The power of kindness. If our enemies is in need, whatever it is, and we have the resources to meet that need, then we should help them. According to Romans chapter 12. According to God. Our simple act of kindness, you know, it might lead to reconciliation. Our simple act of kindness can melt that person's heart. And it might lead to a wonderful reconciliation that you long for so many years. Now, Paul was somewhat, somewhat re-echoing the teachings of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 6. When Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credits is that to you? Even sinners, even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. So if we will just choose the person that loves us and to love them back, Jesus said, even sinners do that. If we will just choose to love those who love us, and if we will just choose to do good to those who do us good, then Jesus said, even sinners do that. And that is not the way of a Christian character. That is not the way of a true servant of God. The way of a true servant of God is love those who hate you. Forgive those who done you wrong. Help even your enemies. If they are needing something, help if it is in your power to do so. And there are so many verses that we can talk about, we can read about, about kindness, about love, forgiveness. But all of these things, they stem out of our love for God. You cannot truly forgive if you do not truly love God. You cannot truly manifest this fruit of a Christian character if you do not truly love the Lord. See, that the fruit of a Christian character, it separates us from the world. It separates us from the world. We think and we behave differently because we have the Lord. Now, the way we live our lives is very important because it is the manifestations of our beliefs. By our way of living, we also project and we magnify that God lives in us. And living an obedient faith and manifesting our faith through our character is what it means that we bear much fruit, the fruit of a Christian character. And this is what glorifies the Father, according to John chapter 15, verse 8. Brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. I hope that we all bear much fruit in our character and the way we live. And if any of us here, even in our Zoom watching, have not yet accepted the Lord, the invitation, we send out the invitation to you. Come now, offer your life to Jesus, accept him, repent of your sins, and be baptized. And you will receive the forgiveness of your sins, and you will, not, you will have that hope 
of eternal life someday in heaven. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? <laughs>